Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. Caleb, please, if you can, give me a bit more. You're going to kill me this morning. You're going to kill me. Just give me a bit more volume. Put more on the high end. Uh, not too much so that it doesn't clip. Just give me a bit more treble. Thank you so much. Much better. Are we in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21? I don't know what you did there. Go back to how you did it. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. Are we together? Can read this together on the count of three. One, two, three. Okay, stop, stop. Some of you are reading like you're being charged to read. Okay? Are we ready to read? Let's read like on the count of the read like you're gonna get a big present after this, okay? Because it's Christmas. On the count of three. One, two, three. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Micah chapter five and verse two. And seeing as you're doing such a great job this morning of reading, you will read with me just this scripture and we'll move on micah chapter 5 and verse 2 are we ready are we ready okay on the count of three one two three but you bethlehem ephrath though you are small among the clans of judah out of you will come from me yes Amen. Okay, now I also want you to read one more scripture. I want people to go to this. Go to Isaiah. This is my main scripture. Isaiah chapter. Let me find it. Thank you, Lord. This is not. Isaiah chapter 5. Is it 9? Isaiah 9, 6. Go to Isaiah 9, verse 6. If it is the one. Isaiah is always, I don't know why I always fail to find it. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. If you don't know this, you need to be born again. And you haven't gone through Christmas. Okay, let's read this together on the count of three. One, two, three. For unto, uh-huh. 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 Amen. The Bible says, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Everlasting Father, we want to thank you, glorify you, and honor you for the great things that you are doing in our lives. Lord, we believe that you are God that answers by fire. You have said that a nation can be born in one day. We pray, Lord, today, birth something supernatural in the lives of your people. Birth something spectacular in this church. Birth destiny. Birth change. Birth a new movement, mighty God birth new thinking birth innovation birth ideas gift people today with visions and dreams of where you want them to be we glorify and honor you in jesus mighty name we pray and every saint said amen amen today i want to preach teach on something that i have entitled it's been given it's been given so i want you to high five your neighbor before you take your seat and just let them know it's been given hey if my blessing was based on your high five i would refuse you may take your seats and may be seated in the heavenly places it's been given the beauty of the Christmas period is that many of us begin to build expectation for where we want to be or build expectation for the things that we want 
for the end of the year, but also expectation for maybe things that we want to see over this Christmas period. Um, if you are like me or you're like my family, uh, we begin to campaign and give each other ideas of what we want for Christmas. We begin to give signals, we begin to give hints and say, hey, here's an idea just in case you want to buy me a gift for Christmas. Um, many times some of these gifts are out of price ranges, but we continue being the faith-believing people that we are, that somebody somewhere will buy this gift for us. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, I don't know about you, but the beauty of Christmas is always believing for a gift, even maybe when I didn't expect. Okay. Even when people say, I'm broke, something in you still says, Somebody has to buy me a gift. Because Christmas always creates an expectation. Christmas always creates an expectation. And, and we know from the, the, the story that is Santa Claus, we're always told that you'll get a gift based on whether you've been good or whether you've been bad. They say he'll give you a gift whether you've been naughty or whether you've been what? Nice. Uh, but the one thing that is clear is that everybody has an expectation. Tell your neighbor, I have an expectation. You're not blessing me. Tell him one more time, I have an expectation. Everybody has an expectation around this period. If you're like me, you also begin to strategize and begin to calibrate yourself and review how the year has been so far and maybe what you can do better for the next year. There's just something about this time and this season that forces us to either review our status quo uh, and make plans for the next year and also build something which I believe is very critical for a believer for any person which is expectation look at your neighbor one more time and say i have an expectation and there's nothing like christmas i remember growing up and seeing christmas trees like the one that we have here and early on in our childhood we used to see boxes appear under the christmas tree and you just used to feel like the bigger the box the better the christmas you know what i'm saying the bigger the box the bigger the expectation and you begin to wonder what is under that box you begin to shake the box you begin to feel how heavy the box is hoping that there's something that will shock you in there uh, as you build up your expectation but sometimes there were some christmases that we had where you know our parents were forthright and said this year there will be nothing and you'd hope that this was some kind of a joke that somewhere, somewhere along the lines, uh, something somewhere would come up. But there were some Christmases that would come and you'd get nothing. And I don't know about you, but every time I experienced that disappointment, it affected my expectations. There's something about disappointment that makes you shift your expectation. I believe everybody is born with expectation. I believe everyone builds expectation. But as we encounter disappointment along in life, we begin to shift, we begin to alter our expectations. You could enter into a relationship, into a business, into an idea with great expectation. But at the first sight of disappointment, or at the sight of multiple occasions of disappointment, you begin to shift back your your, your expectation many of us are living in a time now where we want to manage our expectations not because we don't believe that God doesn't be answer our prayer not because we don't believe that God heals not because we don't believe that God can deliver not because we don't believe that God can come through for us but the fear of disappointment has reduced our expectation and this is the work of the enemy because the enemy wants to kill off your expectation but my bible says the expectations of the righteous shall not be what cut off uh, so so god wants you to have an expectation tell your neighbor i have an expectation you're not blessing me look at me look at them one more time and tell them i have an expectation oh okay i want you to do me a favor say neighbor I have an expectation. Okay, I didn't expect that. Okay? I don't know who did that, but I didn't expect that. I want you to look at your neighbor one more time and tell them, neighbor, I have an expectation. Uh -uh. Look at them one more time and say, neighbor, I have 
an expectation. Uh, it's always amazing how people develop an expectation in this time of the year. Uh, they naturally get happy in December. We even say, Ki December. I don't know what is expected in December, but nobody can be sad throughout December. I wrote, I watched somebody write on Facebook the other day, says, hey, I don't have any plans for December. Then someone responded, my friends, just get up and shower. Plans will find you. Because there's always an expectation that something somewhere is going to happen. Am I talking to somebody in this place? Uh, if you were like me and when we used to be in the world, thank God for the hand of salvation. Thank God for the grace of God. Thank God that he picked me up from the miry clay. But if I was still in the world around this time, I'm not sure whether I'd be awake right about now. I might be nursing a few headaches I'm not preaching to some people in this place. But it always seemed like even when you had no plan, you still expected something to happen. Am I preaching to somebody this morning? Because everybody has an expectation, but many times because of what we've gone through, we reduce our expectation. We reduce our hopes. We reduce our beliefs and there's just something magical something great about the december period that no matter how difficult the year has been you develop expectation there's just something beautiful about this time of the year that you even though you may not have achieved everything you want uh, if you're like me i think you'll be more upset in november than you are in december November, you try, try, try. If it fails in December, you're like, ah, anyway, let's enjoy the year while we can. Because there's something about this time of the year that we develop an expectation. Look at your neighbor one more time. Tell them I have an expectation. I have an expectation. You know, the beauty of, of, of the Christmas story or this time of the year is the expectations that were brought uh, we see that God places an expectation on the family of, of Mary and Joseph he says you will have a son and this son shall be the savior this son is expected to do the great things this son is expected to save the world this son is expected to be the Messiah but the problem is that this message comes in a form of scandal. This message comes in a form of mystery. This message comes from a town uh, called Nazareth where nothing good is expected to come out of Nazareth. It seems God is trying to bring a scandal before he reveals the story. The background is not making sense for where we are going. Some of you are looking at your lives and wondering why the background of your life is not making sense for the future people are telling you you are called to be great people have told you this year will bless you people have told you God has an assignment for you but when you look at everything that's going on the prophetic word that God is speaking is not aligning with where you are but I want to let you know that the background sets the scene but never determines the story any background only sets a scene it doesn't tell the story where you are does not determine where you are going where you are right now has not limited God's plan for your life the Bible says even in the depths of hell God is there meaning that it doesn't matter how deep your story may be God may pick you up out of that situation. It means that, beloved, it doesn't matter how long your situation has died, you can be like Lazarus and God can call you forth from that tomb. I need to let some people know that the beauty of the Christmas story, the beauty of the word of God concerning the birth of the Messiah is simply saying that the background does not, the scene does not determine the story. The scene does not set the story. It simply is a starting point from where God is going to pick you up from. I came to declare for somebody that December 
is not the end of your life. It might be the end of the year, but it's not the end of your life. I wish somebody would boldly declare that God has still got great things in store for me. That from this day forward, I'm believing God for a miracle. I'm believing God for a breakthrough. I'm believing God for something different in my life. Take a look at me right now because this is the lowest I will ever be. Take a look at me right now and get you don't get used to this picture this is simply the background but God has a tendency of pulling the main character from the background God has a tendency of making a somebody out of nothing so don't judge me by my scene but begin to recognize my story it doesn't matter whether I was born in Nazareth it doesn't matter whether I was born in Lubuto it doesn't matter whether I was born in senior God is still God and my background does not determine my story where I was born does not determine where I end up oh I wish I had somebody who was believing God in this place how I started this year does not determine how I will end I'm preaching better than you're acting right now my background doesn't determine my story listen to me my my english diction does not determine how graced i am are you hearing me who my father was does not determine where i am going because i have a father of fathers i am a son of the king i am the son of the most high beloved let me tell you something your history is not his story ah you're not hearing me. Your history is not his story. God will use your history to carve out your story. He'll pick you up and show you that he has a plan for you. If you're believing God this morning, somebody say amen. amen. The Bible says that Terah had been told by, 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 um, by God to go into the Chaldeans. But Terah settled in Haran when he was supposed to settle in the Chaldeans. But the Bible clearly says that in spite of Terah's shortcomings, God still spoke to Abraham. I came to prophesy over somebody's life. No matter how short your parents came, God will still pick you up from that situation. Ah, you're not believing me in this place. No matter what your parents could not do for you, God will do for you. No matter where your parents have stopped, God is still working in your life. Where they ended is where you will begin. Their foundation or their ceiling shall be your floor. Thank God for what they could do. But my God is greater. The Bible says, no matter how my father or my mother forsake me, the Lord will never leave me. I came to prophesy over your life that God has not left you that God has not forsaken you that God has still got a plan for you can I preach to a few people in this place you are talking about your history can I tell you of a guy by the name of David his father forgot that he had a son and didn't even invite him to the meeting he didn't invite him to the prophetic meeting but the Bible declares that the prophet said there is but one more son and we Will not sit until he gets here I came to prophesy over somebody's life no matter how your family has forgotten you no matter how some people have neglected you my God is saying this year will not end until you arrive we will remain standing until you arrive we will remain waiting until you arrive because this year is waiting for you this year is not waiting for anybody else it's waiting for you my bible tells me creation ah, i can feel this thing can i preach it like i feel it this morning the bible says creation awaits the manifestation of the sons of god meaning that i'm not waiting for 2019 2019 is waiting for me preach to somebody this morning my background doesn't determine my story it doesn't matter even Hannah's barrenness could not stop the birth 
of a Samuel. Come on, man of God. I'm preaching this morning. I'm preaching this morning. Meaning that for the sake of Samuel, God had to open Hannah's womb. I prophesy over somebody because of the promise over your life. Wherever there is barrenness, God will do a miracle in that place. Wherever doors have closed, God will open that door because of your destiny. If you believe it, say amen. My background doesn't determine my story. Uh, but here's the thing. We all expecting a savior. And, and, and God, in his infinite wisdom, knows that the world needs a savior. Now, can I get two people? I like to illustrate here. Mamba, please come because you're, I, I need someone. Yeah, yeah, okay. I need somebody smaller. No, no, no. You sit down, sit down. I didn't come. Come, my guy. I didn't come, come, come. Just for the sake of illustration, uh, for this, it, the Bible says that, 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 earth needed a savior or he says to mary in matthew that she'll give birth to the son his name shall be jesus and he will save all the people from sin and the thing is this is that when you are expecting a savior and you've got big problems you're looking for big saviors can i preach this thing like i feel it Fred, can I preach this thing like I feel it? No, 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 no. no. When, when, when you have big problems, you're looking for big solutions. But for some reason, God knows that we need a savior, but he doesn't give us a fully grown man. He gives us a boy, a baby for this illustration. Don't look at him. But for the sake of this, because... When I say this is your savior, you will be like, okay, I see some semblance of salvation ability in him. But if we send, I mean, Brother Aiden, I don't know, maybe he knows judo, maybe he knows kung fu, but your expectation will be like, this guy can say, but don't try him, he weaves, he weaves. <laughs> this is real talk, he beats, okay? Bruce Lee, uh -huh, uh -huh. preaching to somebody in this place. Because your idea is that God will send a big savior. Uh, and this is what I want you to see. You see, many of us are always looking for God in the big things. But we fail to see God. Ah, oh, can I preach this thing, man? You see, the beauty of the Christmas story is a reminder that God is God even in the big and God is God even in the... Ah, uh, can I preach this thing? Can I preach this thing like I feel it? You see, we fail to see God in the picture in small things. We fail to see that God can use small things to save us. You're not hearing me. You see... You don't realize because you're looking for something mythical. You're looking for something big. You're looking for something that your eyes can see. That's something the size of a baby boy. Your mind cannot comprehend. But I want to let you know that God has a tendency of using small things to achieve the supernatural. You're not blessing. God has a tendency of using the small things and achieving the supernatural. That's why he says you don't need Big faith, you just need, you know, hear me. It's why he says you don't need big faith, you just need small faith. Faith the size of the mustard seed. So I came to preach deliverance to a few people who felt like you have run out of faith or your faith has reduced. God is not looking for big faith. He's looking even for little faith because if he can just use a little faith, he can use this little faith to move mountains. He can use this little faith to remove your enemies. He can use this little faith to remove all the obstacles. I came to preach to somebody that your mind is filled with 90% 
doubt. Your mind is filled with 90% fear. But there's that 10% in your mind that somehow still says, I can get through this year. That somehow still says, I can get through this situation. That somehow still says, some way, somehow, God is going to get me through this. I came to preach to somebody who has been going through trials and tribulation. You didn't want to be in church this morning, but something still said, go to church. I came to preach to somebody this morning who felt like God is far away, but somehow you still decided to open your Bible. It didn't make sense. It didn't feel like anything was happening, but God said, that's the 10% I need. That's the small faith I need to achieve a miracle. I came to preach to somebody that God is still going to do something great for you. As long as you have a little faith, tap your neighbor and say, I have an expectation. Come on, tap your neighbor and say, I have an expectation. It might be late in the year, but I still have an expectation. It might look like the odds are against me, but I still have an expectation. My biological clock looks like it's ticking, but I still have an expectation. Uh, my CV doesn't stack up, but I still have an expectation. My bank account says zero, but I still have an expectation. You see, that's what God does. God sends small things to help you build your expectation. You guys may take your seats. God sends small things to help you build up an expectation. Look at this. You see, the way God works is that God uh, knows what you need. He doesn't just look at your situation, but he knows what you need. You see, when Adam ate the fruit, God realized that Adam's sin came from eating what? Fruit, right? So what would the answer be? Ah, you see, you're not paying attention. You see? Let me show you. You see how God works. God knows that Adam's mistake was eating the fruit. So how does God redo this? He redoes it by sending fruit. Some of you missed that one already. Jesus is the fruit. You see, you see, some of you don't realize that what looks mighty or big now in your life came from small, 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 small decisions that you made and they became big. So you're thinking that God is going to give you a new tree. Uh -uh. God says, I'm going to give you a new fruit. Uh -uh. And God wants to see how you take care of the new fruit. Because the Bible says, wisdom is proved right by its fruit. Oh man, can, you guys are not feeling me. I feel like we have to work this thing. We still have to work this thing. So, wisdom is proved right by its what? Its fruit, right? But you and I know that when you water fruit, or for the fruit to grow, you don't water the leaves. You water where? You water where? So, so redemption must begin to be seen in the decisions that you make. I don't know about you, but that's the good thing about the year end. The year end allows you to reassess your decisions and say, where did I go wrong? How can I change these things? That's why we should be grateful that God gives us another year. It's not to, to remind us of how old we are getting. It allows us to reassess our situation. That's why God gives us times and seasons to help us assess our decision making. Uh, uh, but the thing about God that I've realized is that whenever God releases something, it's never as big as we think. He likes to give people small beginnings. He says, though your beginnings may be humble, uh, your end thereof shall be great. God likes to give faith the size of a mustard seed. He likes to give small visions. The Bible says that, that, that Elijah saw a cloud or his servant saw the cloud the size of a fish. And Elijah began to proclaim that it is about to rain. So God has a tendency of releasing small things to do great things. 
You're not with me right now. God has a tendency. Why does God do that? Because I want you to write this down. Because whatever God gives graciously requires faithfulness to develop. <laughs> whatever God gives by grace requires faithfulness to develop. God does not give you fully grown situations. He gives you something that you must see grace in, but use your faith to develop it. Oh, man. He, he won't give you a fully-fledged business idea. He'll just give you a small idea. He won't give you a complete spouse. Hey, he must very, very, he must dish, he must have everything. He's crazy. <laughs> if he has everything, that guy is crazy, he will kill you. <laughs> he will kill you. Who watched, who's watched those movies? You know, there was that movie, I don't remember all right, I think it was a Tyler Perry movie, where this woman left her boring husband and went for this guy who had a jet, he had a suit, he was sick. Sanga Tirishiru. Man, can I preach to you as well? She will not come complete. Uh, she's beautiful, but got some crazy in her too. Because whatever God gives graciously requires faithfulness to develop. God blesses you with a child, but says you raise the child. Uh -huh. You see that? Because whatever God gives graciously requires faithfulness to develop. I don't know this generation of today that has got, you know, mobile phones and can take pictures and just share. But we're from the old school where we required film. Who remembers the days of film? Kodak. Fuji film. But the beauty of those films is there was a divine lesson in there that great memories were developed from negatives. God uses negative situation to de develop great pictures. So I came to preach to somebody, right now your life might look negative. Your bank account might look... Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. That relationship looks... But I came to let you know, God is about to develop a great picture from that story. <laughs> because great memories are developed from negatives. Negatives, negatives. Some of you are like, no, but we're in the digital age. We're in the digital age. Let me tell you something. If you know anybody who is a good colorist of pictures or developer, they still have to play with what they call the highlights and the shadows. Those are the whites and the blacks. Ah. That's what brings out the picture. But I digress because whatever God gives, he gives graciously, requires faithfulness to develop. The easiest part, beloved, is being gifted. The easiest part is having the child. The easiest part is conceiving the idea. The easiest part is having the vision. The easiest part is having the dream. That's the easiest part. The hard part is raising that dream. The hard part is raising that gift. Uh, can I preach to somebody? The, the easiest part is falling in love. Uh. The hard part is staying. Because this generation, if, you're, you're, if it's meant to be, it will be. Are you mad? Good things come to those who wait. I'm still looking for that scripture. It's not in the Bible. If it's yours, let it go. And it will come back. Foolishness. 
the Bible says that the shepherd who lost the sheep left the 99 and went to look for it. He didn't say, if it's mine, it will come back. Get out of here, man. We got to learn, we got to learn to work for some things. We've got to learn to work for that dream. We've got to learn to work for that vision, work for that marriage, work for that relationship, work for that ministry. The easiest part is being gifted. The easiest part is having the baby. Nine months seems like nothing in comparison to 19 years. Until that boy leaves your house. Some mothers right here are like, amen. <laughs> amen. The easy part, because the Bible says, unto us a son is born. But unto us a child is, sorry, a child is born. And unto us a son is given. Because children can be born. But the son has to be given. Meaning it's easy to have an expectation. But you have to work that expectation. That's why the Bible says, work out your salvation. Work out your expectation with fear and trembling. The hardest part, beloved, is managing the grace and the gift that God has given you. That's the hard part. And I want to talk to a few people today and say, though it may be late in the year, don't give up the little things that you are doing right now that are managing your gift. I don't know what happens. In school, we used to call it December silly season. We used to call it silly season. The headmaster used to call it silly season because it's just something happens in this time of the year where people lose focus. You just you stop going to work. You stop doing things. You stop, you stop investing in the right places. You started the month with a good budget, but by the end of the month, not end of the month, mid-month, your prayer points have changed. Lord, come through for me. Because you've finished the budget. Because let me tell you something, the, hard, the easiest part is receiving something. That's the easiest part. All you guys say, I receive, I receive, I receive, I receive. That's the easy part. The hard part is managing what God has blessed you with. That's the hard part. The easy part is God giving you a miracle. The hard part is you managing your miracle. Am I preaching to somebody? Look at your neighbor and say, I have an expectation. See, God gives Mary a child. He doesn't, she doesn't give Mary a full-blown man. She gives Mary a child because Mary has to learn to manage the miracle. One of the things that we all need as believers is the skills to manage the miracle, the skills to manage the gift, the skills to manage the vision. Am I preaching to somebody in this place? Look at your neighbor and say, I have an expectation. Look at them one more time and say, I have an expectation. You see, that child has to grow up. And the Bible says that it was only at the age of 30 that Jesus emerged as the Savior that he was. Meaning that for 30 years, somebody had to feed that baby for, or that child. For 30 years, somebody had to help provide for that child. You know, Jesus was a man by that stage, but he was still living with his folks. You know, for, so some of you are still 29 in your parents' house. There's hope for you. There's hope for you. You know what I'm saying? There's hope for you. Because Jesus was the, <laughs> he was the Savior. Mom, his mom was like, when are you leaving? 28. He's like, mom, just hold on. I, am I talking to somebody in this place? Somebody had to help raise this boy when he was in his, in his teen years. The Bible says he disappeared. And the parents had to go look for him. You know, somebody has to invest in this. Somebody has to do this. And, and so God shows an example that whenever he wants to change your life, he has to reduce you. To give you focus. 
He has to reduce you to give you focus. Uh, that's why John the Baptist said it this way. He says, I must decrease so that he may do what? I must decrease so that he may do what? Increase. Beloved, that's why some things that you are doing right now won't make sense to your people. It won't make sense to the people around you. Maybe that you have reduced your time that you're hanging around with people. Maybe you've reduced your friendships. Maybe you've reduced even some of the things that you used to do and used to love. Maybe you've even reduced your, your preferences or your desires to things of God and it looks like you've become a, 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 a holier than thou. What they don't realize is that you are investing in your destiny. What what they don't realize is that you are investing in your future. What they don't realize is that you are managing your miracle. When they ask you why are you the way you are today and they make you feel like you, are, you, are, you have changed or, or you think that you are better than they are, let them know that I'm not trying to be better than you are. It's just that I know that God has got better things for me right now. I'm managing my miracle. I'm too busy managing my destiny to care what somebody thinks about me. I'm I'm too busy managing the miracle that God has blessed me for me to care where somebody else is going. When you're managing your miracle, you're not looking at what everybody else is doing. You're not looking at whose son is going further than your son. You're not looking at who's building more than you are building. You're not looking at what else everybody else is doing. You're busy looking at your situation and you're being grateful for what you have. I wish there were some people who were saying, Lord, I'm grateful for what I have because I've come to realize that God will never give you the next thing until you handle the current thing, until you manage your current position, until you manage your current finances, until you manage your current relationships, until you manage your current vision, until you manage your current position, God will not move you to the next thing because it is through my experiences as I'm managing my miracle, it is through my experiences that I encounter God. God is in our experiences. It is in our experiences. Some things are not going to make sense because you're investing. Because you realize that my son, my child was born, but my son is what I have to invest in. This year was the year of possessing new territories. It was born, but the decisions you make will show us the son you have at the end of this year. Somebody wrote something so powerful the other day, I read it. It says, you are born looking at, like your father or your mother, but you die looking like your decisions. <laughs> you die looking like your decisions. So many of us are looking for God in great things, but God is right in your situation. He's looking at you and saying, how are you managing your finances right now? Before you're asking God for a miracle, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you, and I'm expecting God to come through for you, and I'm expecting God to deliver you. But I want you to know that God is in your current situation, not in your future. This is the mistake we make about God. We make God in a future place when he's with us now. The Bible says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we expect to only know God in the future, but God is saying, I'm with you right now. That's why the Bible doesn't call him a future help. It doesn't call him a past help. It calls him an ever-present help in time of need. Meaning that God is with you where you are right now. And could it be, beloved, that if you just shifted your perspective and shifted your ideas to look at what you have and look at where you are right now and be grateful for what you have, that God will show you the greater things that he has in store for you. That's the beauty of the holiday period. Because you look at your family and you remember what's important. You remember that your family is your family. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, they're still your family. Whether you're, you're successful, whether you're not successful, they're still your family. And there's something about this holiday period that we don't realize that it's not the gifts that make the holiday. It's the gifts that God has already given us. God's gifts are never things. God's gifts are people. That's why Ephesians 4 says that he has given gifts to men. Gifts, people, some to be prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers. 
All these things for the perfecting of the saints. Because whatever God gives graciously, he requires faithfulness to develop. Why? Because it is not the size of the gift that matters. It is the investment in it. The other day, I was watching in this. I was, I was, I was watching a documentary as I begin to wind up, as I begin to wrap this up. I was watching a, a, a documentary the other day. And I was watching on, I think it was History Channel. And I don't know what made me watch the History Channel on um, this other day. And it brought up the atomic bomb. How many of you remember the atomic bomb? One of the most tragic moments in, in history, but also one of the most, you know, uh, significant moments in history. Because it was that moment that made people relook at each other and say, hey, we don't know who's carrying atomic bombs. Because every time people thought they were carrying um, infantry or artillery based on the size of their army up until that point they used to measure the power of a nation by the size of its army right but it was through the atomic bomb that people began to shape and shift and change their perspective so I was reading the story of this atomic bomb and how it was developed and basically what happens with the atomic bomb is that there is one nuclear bullet, right? It's a uranium bullet. It's the size of your pinky, the tip of your pinky. And it's fired into the chamber, right? Up until that point, uh, towards the end of the Second World War, America had been attacked by a whole, whole battalion of Japanese um, air forces, or the Japanese air forces attacked Pearl Harbor. We should have watched Pearl Harbor. I don't know if anybody has watched Pearl Harbor, but terrible movie. But anyway, that's another story. But Pearl Harbor happened and America decided to retaliate with a bomb that they had been developing all along. Listen to me. It was a bomb that they had been what? Developing. So while the enemy was attacking them, they were developing. While the enemy thought that he had a, a, one up on them they were developing something the problem now was that what they were developing looked smaller than what was before them and, and, and they said that they developed an atomic bomb and, and, and this bomb was one uranium bullet that was fired into a uranium chamber chamber right and the chamber had a bomb the entire bombshell was probably the size of the distance of this aisle that's the entire bomb that's the entire bomb Japan went over with a whole uh, air force, America went with a bomb. Japan went over with, I don't know how many people, America went with one bomb. And, and the thing is that when you actually look at what makes the bomb, it's not even the size of the shell. It was one uranium chamber, that bullet that was fired into a chamber, and all it took, they said that, it took 45 seconds, 45 seconds, 45 seconds for the bomb to detonate. And the war was literally over because of the two bombs in 90 seconds. The war was literally over in 90 seconds. It took 90 combined seconds to bring the Second World War to an end. Bear in mind they fought for five plus years, but the war ended on account of 90 seconds. So I, I don't know who I'm preaching to in this place. It may look like the enemy has been attacking you on all fronts, but God has been building you up. God has been building you up. God has been building your, your artillery. And, and the beauty about it is that what God is building looks small to men. It doesn't make sense to men because if it did make sense to men, they will attack what you have. So, so it's okay that they attack everything around you. Let them attack 
your family. Let them attack your business. Let them attack uh, everything that they think is of value. But what they don't realize is that the true value is not what's on the outside. The true value is what's on the inside. What makes a man or a woman is not their height or their size. It's their inside. And what is on the inside may look small but still carries enough power. I want to let somebody know right now that what God has instilled in you right now may be a little vision. What God has instilled in you may be a little dream. What God has instilled in you may be a little idea. But that little thing, when put in the right environment, will cause a nuclear reaction, will cause something of significant change. I came to preach to you right now. Though your enemies may look more than you are, the the Bible says that the prophet prayed, help the man see that many are those that are with us than those that are against us. I came to let you know that God has already given you value. And the thing about value is value isn't based on the size of the gift, but on the capacity of his grace. God had packaged the entire capacity to save mankind in a baby boy. But it took time for that baby boy to be developed. So so that that baby boy could be mature enough to save the entire world. I came to preach to somebody today that your value isn't in the size of your gift, but in the capacity of his grace. The Bible says we are not rich according to our bank account, but we are rich according to his riches in glory. It is the capacity of his grace that God has blessed you with. I came to let you know that you have everything you need right now. Stop looking into the outside the atomic power is on the inside the atomic power is within you it may not make sense right now and people are looking at you as one plane flying over the island of Hiroshima one plane flying over the island of Nagasaki when Japan attacked America they attacked with an entire air force but America only came with one plane the Bible clearly says that when, the, when David stood before Goliath, he looked like a boy in front of a giant. God has a tendency of making you look small in front of your enemies. God has a tendency of making you look weak in front of your enemies. God has a tendency of making it appear like you've lost your mind because he uses not the wise things. He doesn't use the intelligent things. He uses the food foolish things uh, so right now you are standing before your year end with that one little idea some of you are only left with one more idea only left with one thousand quarter only left with one contact uh, only left with one opportunity but God says I only need 90 seconds to change your 2018 I only need 90 seconds uh, to change your life uh, to to change your destiny because the value is not in the size of the gift but in the capacity of his grace can I preach it like I feel it in this place you're not blessing me I say can I preach it like I feel it in this place some of you are saying pastor I have nothing I don't know what you're talking about I don't have anything right now I came to let you know Bible says in Christ we have all things not some things but we we have all things not only do we have all things but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me his strength is on the inside of me and I came to let you know that you need to look at what you already have God has already blessed you with a boy and he's telling you that there is a son in that boy he's telling you in that dream there is a company he's telling you in that relationship there's a destiny he's telling you in that school there's an encounter he's telling you in that gift there's a ministry can I preach to somebody in this place because you need to realize what you already have you need to realize what God has already gifted you with the beauty of this Christmas period is a reminder that through Christ's birth God gave us everything he didn't give us some things he gave us everything I and hear some people right now saying 
Pastor, what have I been given? My father never gave me anything. Nobody gave me an opportunity. But my God says this, through his son Jesus Christ, he has given us the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Can I tell you what else he has given you? He has given you power because he says uh, as many have believed him uh, he has given them uh, the power uh, to become uh, the sons of men uh, he has given you joy uh, because the bible says the joy of the lord uh, is my strength uh, i'm not looking for joy uh, i already have joy can i preach this thing like i feel it uh, he has already given me healing uh, because i'm not looking for healing in medicine uh, I thank God for medicine. I'm not telling you don't take medicine. But whatever the medicine does uh, is what Jesus has already done. Uh, because it says by his stripes uh, we have been healed. Uh, meaning that healing is something that we have been given. Uh, he has given us prosperity. Because my Bible says uh, my God shall supply all your needs. Uh, my needs have been given by God. Uh, my needs have been met on the cross uh, my needs have been met on Calvary oh I'm preaching better than some of you are behaving right now because I believe that God is about to do great things uh, but I came to preach to two or three people who are believing God for a miracle before the end of this year that God is about to do anything uh, and everything that is needed uh, in your life uh, because the Bible says uh, that he has given us the earth uh, he says the earth belongs to the Lord uh, but he has given it uh, to the sons of men. Uh, the Bible says, having not spared his son, uh, but given him to us, uh, how shall he not freely, not by cost, not by price, uh, you don't have to pay for this, uh, how shall he not freely give us all things? Uh, I came to let you know uh, that God has given you all things. Uh, God has blessed you already. God has come through for you already. God has healed you already already God has delivered you already God has delivered you already God has set you free already God has prospered you already God has lifted you already God has promoted you already God has already defeated your enemies God has already set you up in your place if somebody believes in this place somebody say hallelujah come on say hallelujah God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory unto us a child is born but a son is given it was the boy that they overlooked who became the savior The Bible says, the stone that the builders did what? Ah, the stone that the builders rejected. You see, when you look at the birth of Jesus, it is a story of rejection. Okay, okay, I want to dispel a few myths. Jesus was not born in a manger because his parents were poor it's that there was no space for him did you hear what I said so so the inn rejected him because they had no space for him some of you God has had to make people reject you he's had to make places that you felt comfortable and confident in no longer feel confident the places had to spit you out it is in that place of rejection that the Savior came forth it is in that place where everybody seems to have walked away from you 
when the only things around you seem to be animals. That God says, this boy, born in a manger, born not in the company of kings, but in the company of animals. This is the one who is the everlasting father, counselor, prince of peace. Hey, the government shall be on his shoulders. I want to talk to some people right now. Some of you have lost money and people have walked away from you. God has to allow that so you can see who's truly for you. God had to allow that. God had to allow that. I, I thank God for what I've been through in this year. I thank God that it was when I began to change my mind and change to see things God's way that I began to see some people clearly. I began to see some things clearly. I began to see some situations clearly. Listen to me. Until you begin to see God in your current situation, you will never see clearly for where you are going. So God has to bring clarity by removing the clutter from your life. Sometimes some things can only be seen when you remove some things, when you clean some things up, when you put some things in order, when you put some things to the side, when you remove some things out the room, when you begin to put things in their position, that things become clear. I thank God for the things that you've been through this year. God has had to remove all the distractions so that you can manage your miracle. Some of you were, were distracted by the benefits of the miracle, that you could not manage the miracle. I, I, you know why I feel like, I feel like God had to allow Jesus to be born in a manger? Can I tell you my philosophy? This is my revelation. I asked God about that. And I believe that that miracle was more for Mary and Joseph than anybody else. Because if they had gone to the palace, they'd have been confused. If they had gone to the palace and seen all the lights and seen all the gold and they had been born in a bougie place, then they would have been confused by these things. The Bible says, it says, as fire is to silver, so is praise to the heart of men. One of the tests of men, right, is praise. And that's the problem with a lot of gifted people. Because gifted people receive praise too early. So sometimes God has to put you in a manger to put you in your place. So sometimes God has to put you in a place that doesn't make sense and still make wise men come and give you gold, frankincense, and myrrh in a manger so that you know this has nothing to do with me. This has only to do with God. I'm preaching to some people in this place. Right now, you're in the lowest place of your life. But if you look at things God has been providing for you supernaturally, when you were broke, people still came to bring you money. When you had no opportunity, still people opened doors. When it looked like you were down, somebody came to lift you up. And God allowed that situation to happen so that you can give him all the glory so that you can give him all the praise so that you can give him all the adoration I came to preach to somebody in this place uh, that manger is the place where you're supposed to manage your miracle so that when your miracle comes out uh, it's not dissuaded by the things of this world it's not dissuaded by the delusions and the illusions of society that's why beloved Jesus had no affinity for money money was not a thing for him because he already knew that everything he was was by the grace of God. I want to let you know God will not bring you out of that place, but He will show you that He's there even in that place. He will sustain you in that place. That's the beauty of the story of the birth of Jesus that the Son was being managed in terrible conditions. But God was still there. Some of you have been crying for new jobs. 
And I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. I, I, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. But I want to tell you this, that God is more concerned about his purpose than your ego. Than your ego. I, I remember being in a time where people who were less, less qualified than me were getting better jobs than me. And I began to ask God, why? 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 I'm the skilled one. I am this. Yes, I, I, I said those things. Have you, have you ever received the testimony of somebody and instead of celebrating, you're like, you? How? The angels of blessing and how did they miss me? But I came to realize that God is more interested in his purpose than in my ego. Wherever you are now is purely by the grace of God. Let me show you the scripture. Let's go to Acts 17 and 26. We'll end with this. I think it's 26. Yeah, 26. It says... This is about God. It says, and has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. Look at this. It says, and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. The New King James Version puts it this way. It says, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. You are not here by mistake. You are not in that place by mistake. But if you recall as a child, what determined the gift you got the next year was how you managed the gift you got last year. I believe that this is what God is saying to some people. Stop looking for the gift and manage what has already been given. Manage the family you've been given. Manage the job you've been given. Manage the relationship you've been given. Because breakthrough is never in what you don't have. It's always hidden in what you've been given. I pray for you. May God begin to reveal to you the great things that you have been given. The miracles that you have been given the relationships you've been given, the opportunities that you have been given. And as you manage those, may he open up new doors for you. I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice that everybody with a vision, everybody with a child, everyone that God has given something to supernaturally, may great things be birthed out of it. May you raise sons and daughters. May the promise that is hidden in your children begin to manifest. May the promise that is hidden in your business begin to manifest. I pray for families and for relationships. May God release the promise of that marriage to you today. May God release the promise of that relationship to you today. May God give you grace skills, knowledge, and wisdom to manage what you've been blessed with. To manage that idea. To look after it. May God give you wisdom to manage your destiny. We glorify and we honor you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. And every saint in this house said, I believe in amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand.